Welcome to Calling All Leaders, conversations with leaders for aspiring leaders. I am Brian Lassen. Joining me today, Harold Wax. He is the Chief Security Officer, Senior Director with BGIS, former Chief Security Officer with Simcor, and as well the uh, recipient, the winner of the Security Director of the Year Award 2020. Harold, absolutely uh, a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Brian. Perfect. So, you know, certainly, albeit that sort of high level overview, uh, obviously not to preclude a very long standing, admirable career, uh, you know, certainly leading to where you are present date. So, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing uh, it's about 22 years of international experience in your realm of corporate security, as well as uh, 24 years in the realm of some very prominent, uh, impressive volunteer law enforcement roles. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, on the on the professional career side, yeah, just I somewhere over 22 years in, in corporate security. Um, you know, I'm one of those stories that uh, that truly started at the entry level um, in, in a really odd way. So I was actually working as a part-time paramedic um, oh, in the okay. greater Toronto area and, uh, you know, living, uh, date me, but I was living off the pager and uh, I needed some extra extra work. I needed to fill in some of the gaps. And, um, you know, they, they say curiosity killed the cat, but in the security industry, it doesn't. It actually helps you get further. I'm a curious soul, so I happened to see uh, two armed guards at, uh, at you know with an unmarked vehicle at a uh, fireworks festival down on Lakeshore, and I had no idea who these guys were. They weren't doing anything at the time, so I didn't feel like I was disturbing them. And I walked up and said, "Hey, how are you? How are you doing? Who are you? What do you guys do?" And uh, it turned out that they were armed ATM technicians fixing bank machines, and they were just you know in between calls and watching the fireworks. So uh, they were really hospitable and talked to me a bit and I asked a little bit about the business and said are you guys hiring? And they said yeah we are and one thing led to another and next thing you know I got a part-time job with uh, with a company based in Mississauga and learning how to fix bank machines and working on armored trucks um, and it was within the first two days or so I met the uh, the director of corporate security for the company and up until that point I had never heard of corporate security. When I heard security I thought a uniformed security guard you know before sure. the guy in plain clothes with a you know semi-auto pistol on his hip and I was like what do you do he's like oh we investigate we do this we stop robberies I'm like this is the coolest job ever like this is great <laughs> and uh, and at the same time you know I, I was still working as a paramedic and I just started with the OPP auxiliary at that point and uh, and I wasn't sure where I was going with my career I wasn't sure if I was going to go into you know maintain my paramedic status and do that full time if I was going to go into policing possibly and I came across this corporate security universe and uh, and it, it it had me it had me right at the get go, uh, and so of course I asked the typical question, being the curious guy, how do you get into this? How does some how does that happen? And I was told, you know, you've got to uh, you got to either come out of law enforcement, make a transition into the private sector, uh, or you got to come in at the entry level. You know, uh, you know, earn your stripes and and do some of the dirty work and learn how to do the business um, and and make yourself available and valuable to us so that we want to bring you on the team. So that's what I did. And uh, from there, it just took off. I worked my way through it, ultimately got into corporate security as an analyst, slowly moved on from there into the investigative side, you know, uh, you know, cut my teeth in the investigative world and made a name for myself and ultimately landed my my first significant senior role um, at, uh, at Simcor as the chief security officer and held that role for 11 and a half years, uh, mostly in the uh, in the physical security and financial crime environment. Uh, and then uh, for the last three and a half years, I've been at BGIS as the uh, as the senior director and chief security officer. So I'm responsible for uh, corporate security and business continuity management for the company. Um, and then on the volunteer side, on the the after hour side, so you know, go back to 1996 is when I uh, I got sworn in with the OPP as an auxiliary constable, and I've stuck stuck with it since. So now I guess we're in the 24th year. Um, I've been throughout the province, uh, throughout the ranks and uh, have enjoyed every minute of it. So I've been doing that consistently. And uh, and then, you know, with my paid role, uh, I tend to travel quite a bit and have a lot of territory to cover. And uh, especially in my role when I was at Simcor, I was a, a subject matter expert in check fraud and, uh, and organized financial crime. And that ultimately led to some speaking opportunities, especially in the US with law enforcement, doing some training sessions. And, uh, and I happened to be in Louisiana at one point and one thing led to another. And, I got commissioned as a uh, as a deputy marshal in Louisiana in Lafayette, Louisiana, and then from there, uh, a reserve police officer with the Lafayette Police Department, which I currently do now. So I guess you spend your uh, your your Toronto winters down there, or at least in a pre COVID landscape, <laughs> or, or maybe not so much. But yeah. but it's interesting you mentioned that because because uh, uh, you know, admittedly, prior to our interview, and of course, trying to do the the best most diligent research I can, it, admittedly, BJIS was not an entity that I was all too familiar with, but certainly not a small entity by any you know small uh you know short short imagination here you know i, I guess uh 
As I understand it, employee base throughout North America, UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia, uh, over 8,000 team members, uh, 300 million square feet of real estate, 30 plus, uh, 30,000 plus locations. So would this be something in the realm of, of, of your role that you would have responsible charge for? Tell us a l- little bit about how, how your function as chief security officer would, would correlate with this you know, vast amount of obviously employees, uh, you know, in, in, in landscape, if you will, to that effect. Yeah, so um, so BGIS as a whole, it's not a security company, right? So it is a, a integrated facility management company. We're doing everything from managing clients' properties to uh, project management and builds. Um, so, you know, when we look at uh, the client base, the majority of our employees are providing services within our client facilities. So um, we are a service provider as opposed to a manufacturer producing things in a factory or anything else. Um, so with that becomes comes another number of challenges, number of risks. So first off, any corporation... You've got to manage the uh, the physical security of your facilities and protection of your assets and protection of your people. So that at a corporate level, not an account level, but at a corporate level, that's a responsibility that falls under me. We then get into you know your, some of your risks with respect to onboarding of people, the hiring, pre-employment screening, everything else. So I own our our background screening policy as well and our standards and manage that with in partnership with our HR group. Um, so we take that on as well within all of our regions. Um, But then you start getting down to the account level. So, you know, we have uh, clients that we have our people embedded in their environments. Um, And so some of our services for some of our clients do involve providing security for their facilities as well and managing security or managing guard contracts, whatever that may be. So I have functional oversight across all of our accounts as it relates to security. So um, in some accounts, as I said, you know, we are delivering some security services, but in others, it's it's a peripheral, right? We're de- we're managing all of the cleaners and the the technicians, we're HVAC and everything else, you know. And we have mobile technicians that are fixing things. But my responsibility is to interact or liaise with with those clients. Uh, and our client base is is pretty much critical infrastructure, um, a lot of critical environments, blue chip companies, and governments, uh, you know, military, government offices, that type of thing. So there's a lot of security and intelligence that's shared amongst that. So. Um, so my team and, and my role specifically, we have that responsibility both on the corporate side and as working with our clients on the client side. Um, and then, of course, liaising with law enforcement and, and the intelligence agencies to keep everybody safe and ultimately keep the business moving. Absolutely. Fantastic. So it sounds like you have a lot on your plate there. But I, but I tell you what, I mean, you know, certainly, and again, speaking that the present landscape, obviously indicative of your, of your current you know, title or role, you know, you have the word chief in front of your title, you have senior director in front of your title. So, you know, certainly this is a, uh, you know, for argument's sake, a perceivable leadership type role. And, you know, certainly at, at that, uh, as I use sort of the analogy, we talk about climbing rungs in a ladder, certainly this this being perceivably the top rung, but obviously all the way down. Uh, and maybe to quote uh, someone, uh, a leadership guru that I like a lot named Simon Sinek, he talks about the idea at this level, you have responsible charge for the people who have responsible charge for the people who have responsible charge of the people in their charge. So certainly there's this succession all the way down. But, you know, in, in this realm, and, and I guess maybe at a high level as a starting point, you know, being that, you know, certainly your role indicative with this idea of, of leadership, certainly at this level, uh, as I've come to know it at, as anyways, you know, really what does at a high level leadership mean for Harold Wax? Well, um, you know, I, I can break it down into into some key areas, right? I, I think leadership uh, involves integrity. Um, you know, you're you're interacting with, you know, again, every level of the organization, from the board of directors all the way down to your brand new employee at the entry level, um, and uh, and regardless of who it is, they have to have confidence that the information you're providing them is. Uh, properly researched and accurate so that they can make informed decisions. Um, and and again, you can't play games, right? So so integrity is first and foremost, as, foremost, as a leader, you know, when you're conveying new standards, new policies, or we've got to unfortunately say no to something, um, you know, they've got to trust that there's no ulterior motives in that, you know, that that we're being honest with them when we're telling them exactly what, what is going on and why. Um, so integrity is extremely important. I think you know, being a leader involves being a role model. So practice what you preach, um, especially if we look at the investigative side of the role. You know, if we're going to investigate somebody for, uh, you know, procurement fraud or expense fraud or something like that, well, my expenses have to be just as clean as everybody else's. Otherwise, we've got a problem, right? So, uh, you know, we've got to lead by example, um, which is extremely important. I think, you know, leadership involves good communication. You have to, you have to be able to 
um, explain to the appropriate audience and, and speak at their level um, what exactly we're trying to achieve or what the issue is and be able to work through that. So you have to be able to communicate and uh, and express. You know, it's it's not it's not an authoritarian universe here. It's not my way or the highway. If it's it's not my way, it's our way. It's the corporate way, and we're doing it because of this. These are the reasons why. And you know, absolutely be open to take suggestions and hear people out, and and maybe even take their advice or or, or make a change because of something they've told you. But in the end, you have to be able to make a decision. And so you have to be decisive, um, but you have to be cognizant that everybody has opinions. Um, and, you know, you may have to hear them out, but ultimately you have to make the right decision for the organization. So it's about taking ownership, taking ownership of of what we're doing, why we're doing it. And uh, and sometimes providing uncomfortable information. Sometimes, you know, you try not to be the uh, the disabler in the in the organization, but sometimes you have to give the bad news. Um, and, and, you know, so what I try and do as a leader, as opposed to saying no, or as opposed to saying. Here's the bad news. It's it's no. However, here's some options to achieve what you're trying to achieve, right? So identify some compensating controls and bring that forward to help them get to where they need to be. So, you know, you have to be a facilitator. You have to be able. You have to be a little bit of a salesman, you know, to be a leader as well, right? You, you have to be able to convince people this is the right thing to do and why, uh, as opposed to getting into you know arguments or confrontations with folks. So, uh, and then last, and I think most importantly, Brian is, you know, if you're managing teams as a leader. Um, you need to be a, a mentor to those teams. You need to take care of them. You need to make sure that you're giving them all of the, the tools on their tool belt so they can go out there and do what they need to do and, and set them up for success, provide them with development opportunities, um, build succession plans, and really stand your people up. And so, you know, I can tell you I'm only as good as my team. If my team falls apart, then I'm garbage. Uh, I won't have a job. Of course. No, absolutely. So I, t I tell you what, there's, there's a lot of things there. And that's that's a fantastic answer, because admittedly, that takes me into the realm of a, of a few things I, I was hoping to sort of unpack with you, if I can use that such terminology. So certainly maybe the last point in, in working working our way backwards, you talk about the idea of, of certainly mentorship and building people up. So, you know, I, I, I'm of the belief and certainly there is a sentiment that uh, a couple sentiments anyways, you know, certainly that leadership. Not about being the best, about making other people better and, and leaders perhaps inherently, you know, there to create other leaders. So, you know, that being said, I, I guess what I'm wondering, you know, as far as you're concerned, you know, is leadership really, you know, just that about creating other leaders as for such example? And if so, uh, you know, do you yourself see some type of threshold as to perhaps how far ahead we should let an employee quote unquote run run ahead of the herd because we're always going to have employees who are the go getters, uh, you know the type of people that they start and they're already asking about how do I become a, a senior manager or things like that and there's there's obviously admiration for that because you know someone's thinking about ahead and how they want to want to plan themselves but you know as far as maybe recognizing someone who's who is a go getter or maybe has uh, you know shines uh, uh, if I can use such terminology. You know, really, in that respect, how far ahead do we want to let this person run ahead of the herd? Or is there something to say we want to pull the reins? I mean, what's your take on that? So, so I think there's a couple of things there. I think, first of all, um, managing people, you know, if your organization has uh, has some legs to it, then, you know, you really should have a, a, a really solid performance management program or system in place. Um, I rely on that heavily with my team members where, you know, we have annual objectives, performance objectives they have to complete. You know, we have our values that they have to, you know, elicit and they have to uh, present themselves with, but, but we have a development section. And what I like to tell my team members is that development section where they can add development goals, they're not ranked or they're not scored or assessed on their development goals. But that's almost like it's a mini contract. It's a contract in two ways. One, it is that, that my team member expressing to me, hey, I want to develop. I would like to grow. I would like to do more. So these are the things I'd like to try and learn or do. And, and if you agree to this, then you're agreeing to support me, whether it's paying for training or making resources available to them or if they want to shadow me or whatever it may be, it's, it's committing to that. So, so I'm committing to their de development goals and their development wishes. But I think the flip side to that is also, you know, when we're doing a performance review, there's always the question of eligibility for promotion, right? Are you ready now? Are you ready in one to two years, three to four years, whatever it may be? And now what would you what would you say is the distinction between someone's being ready or not? I mean, what what is it a matter of, you know, certain requisite, you know, skills as for such example that you need to see from the person? I mean, what's your take on that? Let, let's well, get maybe maybe peel back the layers a little bit on that. So, well, that's a, that's a great question, Brian. So that's. That's actually what I want to get at is, is so when we look at that eligibility for promotion, that is where the development goal flips into my court, where if I tell a team member, 
you're eligible in one to two years, you're eligible in three to four years. I need to be able to explain to them, is that eligibility strictly based on time? Am I just saying you need you need more time in the seat and then you know four years hits or two years hits or whatever and ta-da, I'm gonna make you a manager or I'm gonna do whatever? Or am I saying you need that time because you need to develop and these are the areas you need to develop? So that's my role as a leader or as a manager is to sit down with my people and say, aside from how you would like to develop, here are the things that I see. So if I say you're ready, then I say you're ready. I mean, we can always learn, we can always expand, but I'm identifying that you're ready for promotion now and I should be lining that up. Um, if, if I say it's one to two years or three to four years, then I can't just give you that timeline. I have to be able to come back and say, what do I expect you to do in that time frame? If I just expect you to sit in the seat and do what you've been doing, it's just a time yeah. thing. And that's it. But if but if I want you to work on your your manager soft skills or I want you to work on your communication or your business acumen or whatever it may be, I need to call that out. And then, again, give you the tools to achieve those goals. Right. Get you into the training yeah. or make resources available to you so you can develop and, and go. But it's, and it's, it, you know, it's sort of interject. It's interesting you say that because there, there, there's something you almost alluded to, which which sort of negates maybe. The view of a lot of you know perceivable leaders and that you know certainly there is a sentiment what advice do you give keep doing what you're doing you know you'll, you'll get somewhere just well no if that was the case i would be where i want to get to that next one right now so no right. what is it you haven't seen yet so so it's, it's certainly interesting you say that but again w with this idea maybe to just sort of sh shift gears a little bit here the idea of rising in successive ranks and, and building i mean certainly you yourself being where you are right now indicative of the senior director you know chief security officer role obviously there's been successive uh, ranks you know numerous rungs in a ladder that you've climbed so i'm curious i mean you know maybe for for starters here when you sort of look back was there one sort of defining moment or role or, or, or rank however you want to word it where you realize to yourself you know what this isn't about uh, you know tactical thinking what i was doing in the front lines there's this all encompassing world called leadership it really is a skill unto itself maybe, maybe you can walk us through this sort of re realization or coming of age if you will yeah i, I would th i would say that that pivotal moment for me in my career um was when i transitioned from being a senior investigator for uh, for the largest armored car company um to a regional security manager and and i thought in my head i'm like okay it's a pay raise and yeah there'll be a little bit more responsibility or whatever but but um but that's it and and i learned very quickly that that's not the case when you when you get into this management role and now you're managing people but you're also managing the the delivery of the services it's not just completing a successful investigation. It's not just wrapping that up in a bow. It's about the ongoing management of your area of responsibility. It's about knowing your area of responsibility and being prepared in case something goes wrong. Um, so that was an eye opener. But I'll tell you, one of the other opportunities I had when I moved into that manager role was uh, having a discussion with with my manager, who was a vice president. And uh, and he outlined uh, some some areas where I needed to develop. And, and again, the conversations I have with my people now, he kind of did the same thing. And he said, you know, you're a great investigator. You understand the, the, the security environment. I, I've got no issues with that. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep growing. Keep, keep learning. You're going to continue to get better and better and better. But he said, you're not out there in the industry. You know, you haven't um, you haven't obtained any any designations, professional designations to show your continuing education uh, and to show that you're growing. You, you're not speaking uh, at any events, professional events or anything else. You need to get public. You need to be out there. And, I was, like, and I was just like, I, that's not me. I don't want to be on the stage. And he said, <laughs> and he said look, he goes, I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat. If you want to sit in the big chair, if you ever envision yourself being in a, in a senior leadership position, you need to get out there. You need to join these associations. You need to volunteer. And I, uh, you know, I was, it was probably a month after that I joined my first professional association and started participating at that level. And I, and I thought, I wasn't sure if this was the right way and if this guy was crazy. He was 100% on the money. I, that's where I began to like network. I began to meet people. I began to understand what the rest of the professional environment was like. And I was able to develop, you know, great colleagues and contacts as well as some mentors to help me along in my career path. But, you know, I think that was a pivotal moment when I went from being, I'll call it a doer to a leader was really that change moving into management. So would it be fair to say that this sort of world you were just talking about, would it be fair to say that this was sort of the middle middle management level, like you're entering the realm of supervisory management? Now, to you, would you would you say arguably or maybe not even arguably that that potentially is, is the hardest landscape to navigate? I mean, would, would you say that? And, and what, are, what are your what are your views on that? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so it's it's an extremely hard spot. I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it, you know, in a policing environment, as an example, that's when you start getting into the NCO, right? You're a sergeant, maybe you're a staff sergeant. 
you're a manager or you're a supervisor and you have some power, you have some authority, but in the end, you're you're not the ultimate decision maker. So, you know, you're kind of sandwiched in between. You've got to toe the party line from, from higher management, but yet, you know, you've got to watch out for your people. You've got to keep them in line, but again, you want to support them and help them grow. And you're still pretty close to the tactical level versus the strategic level. So, you know, it's it's a it's a hard space to be in because you're literally, I think you're changing your hats, you know, every every moment. One one second you're wearing your supervisor hat. Then you're wearing your I'm a boot on the ground hat. Um, and then, you know, other times where you're maybe filling in for your manager, your one up manager. Next thing you know, you know, you're acting, you know, regional manager, or you're acting VP or whatever it may be. And uh, and it can be quite interesting, quite difficult, because when that acting session is over, you typically go back to where you were and you've got to think about your actions and how you treated people and how you interacted with people um and uh and and take responsibility for the decisions that you made so definitely that middle management position or that space is uh is a difficult space to navigate and with that said there aren't as many uh senior leadership roles out there right there's a lot of middle management there's a lot of on the ground but there aren't a lot of the senior roles so that's where you start to kind of weigh people out and, and you can definitely see the people that um can manage versus the people that can lead and you can start to separate the two and and frankly and this isn't the to my own horn it's just the people that that end up being able to lead and and you know empower their their teams to to do what needs to be done those are the ones that start to to move up to the surface and ultimately start to grow and the rest have great careers but they typically say stagnant in that middle management level because they're managers as opposed to leaders I got you. And, and that's an interesting point. So, you know, certainly if someone's, uh, you know, I'll use the terminology loosely, front lines, you know, entry level, uh, you know, th this tactical thinking, you know, arguably, and I, I think the broad general landscape in any, any industry, really, there's a, a great job being done of equipping this person. I mean, really at that at level, your job is to do a good job. I mean, certainly in the corporate security world, maybe it's a matter of, hey, I'll sponsor you to go get the ACES CPP and PSP and, you know, very large designations, things of this nature, but certainly, you know, when you take the next rung up, now you're basically, uh, you know, have responsible charge for the people in your charge, the people who used to do your job. And that can obviously lead to micromanagement because you you obviously got that job because you were good, good at the front line. So overall, I mean, you know, current landscape just in general, not even tied necessarily to one industry. Do you think we, we as, you know, whoever we want to allude that to, do a good job of prepping our leaders to enter the realm of leadership and are really reinforcing this idea of, you know, leadership versus this autocratic micromanaging my way or the highway sort of style? I, I think overall we're getting better, um, but I, unfortunately, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's still um, uh, pockets that uh, are still in a, you know, that autocratic environment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me again. Uh, I, I think as well, um, we still have individuals that uh, get into these these management roles and and then start moving a bit into the leadership roles, but as you mentioned, unfortunately, can't release what it is that they used to do um, and hold on to it and ultimately end up micromanaging. Um, but I think there's a good portion of, of you know, our professional society now that has, uh, that has moved up through the organizations and through the ranks, seeing what can be and what should be. Uh, I think our HR teams are doing really good jobs now at uh, trying to, to educate some of the, uh, some of the, the leadership teams on, on how to better manage our people uh, obviously you know the pandemic has really changed the environment and you know mental wellness and, and health is really big right now and for, for absolutely almost with all of us but um i think you know there's still a tendency for for senior individuals to to attempt to you know, go back and say well i used to do it this way uh and that's the right way to do it uh you have to be open to hearing your people out understand why it is they want to do it differently and sit down and assess it. Take the time with them and say, hey, you know what? Maybe that was the right way to do it three years ago or four years ago when I used to do it. But things have changed. Technology has changed. Process has changed. People and their attitudes and their tolerance have changed. Risk appetite has changed. Maybe we need to look at it differently. So, you know, I, I personally believe it's important that to give my teams the opportunity to express this is what we would like to do. This is what, how we know it needs to be done. But this is what we'd like to do and why. And we think it could create efficiency, you know, greater effectiveness or greater compliance or whatever it may be. And I want to hear them out. And and if I don't agree with them, then as a leader, it's my job not to say, yeah, that's great, but no. It's my job to say, okay, I really <laughs> appreciate what you brought to the table. 
Yeah. But this is why we can't do it. And I have to be able to explain to them so they understand maybe there's a contractual obligation that we're stuck to and we, we can't move. And so we have to keep doing it that way, even though it's on paper instead of electronic, we still have to do it because that's what the contract says we have to do. And I and I walk them through that so they understand. I don't believe in just saying no and walking away because it's, you know, I'm the boss and it's my way or the highway. <laughs> I, want to, I want them to own it as well. Uh, I heard a great term the other day from another organization, which was be an owner. And and I, I really think that's important. Mm -hmm. Regardless of your title or your role, pretend it's your company, pretend it's your organization. What <laughs> to do and why? Be an owner when you make that decision. Uh, and if you're bringing something to the table, be an owner when you bring it to the table and say, this is what I think we should mm -hmm. do and why, um, and, and stand behind it. I think passion in this business is very important. And I can tell you when one of my team come to me with something that they believe in and they're passionate about, they are gonna get every minute of my time to hear them out. I wanna hear them out. And, and if it's something we can do, I'm going to support them on it. And if it's not, I'm going to make sure they completely understand why we can't do it so that they at least feel good about what they brought to the table and why. No, absolutely. And, and to one of your points there, like cer certainly there's the, uh, the notion of uh, leading from the front, I believe, is a terminology. So certainly, even though we're talking about successive ranks and this, that and the other, I mean, obviously, that's not to preclude by, by any stretch of the imagination that that, that sentiment as well. So I do want to uh, maybe, you know, I would be somewhat hard pressed, I suppose, to not uh, sort of speak, albeit briefly on the pandemic. I know you, of course, briefly mentioned that. So, you know, maybe in, in this regard, you know, there is a sentiment, certainly the, the sign of a, of a true leader, perhaps, if I can use that such terminology. Uh, it's how they na navigate or, or sort of, I, I suppose, act in the landscape of a crisis. So, you know, obviously, current pandemic obviously can be uh, con constituted as a crisis. Certainly, one I've never seen in my in my such uh, such uh, time. So, I guess you know what lessons, really, if any, ha have you personally learned? You know, maybe from the leadership standpoint, uh, you know, amidst your role in, in sort of navigating this landscape with the with the coronavirus pandemic. Well, so it's an interesting question, Brian. So, in fact. You know, in my role at, at BGIS, uh, in relation to the pandemic, I'm our global crisis management lead. So I'm leading our crisis management team and our calls, our weekly calls with all of our, our folks across the globe uh, and, you know, interacting with our, our senior executives to make sure they're up to date, et cetera. So there's a lot of activity on the crisis management front. Uh, I, I think th there's two things here. I think one, at, from a leadership perspective, uh, I think what we've, a lot of us have determined is that when we're in the, in the in a state of crisis, uh, people are looking for leadership, right? Uh, our, our folks are looking for guidance. They're looking for leadership, and with social media and uh, and you know the television media and everything else, all of all of the information that's out there. There's information overload, and and information <laughs> is generated based on on different degrees of, of of purpose, right? Is it meant to scare you? Is it meant to sell you something? Whatever it is, is it politically driven or motivated? Um, there's a lot of information out there. And so one of the things we we very quickly discovered during this pandemic from a crisis management standpoint is that our people are looking to leadership to be a source of information, to, again, to be transparent, um, tell them what it is and why it is, uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, fluffing it or a lot of smoke and mirrors. So, um, you know, we found a good portion of of our activity on the crisis management side of the world was really creating situational reports and communications to our to our employee base to make sure they were well informed and give them information that they can use to not only effectively do their job safely, but as well, frankly, take that information home. And that's something that you know I'll tell you in one of our our sessions with our teams, I had a, a, one of our security managers reach back out to me on the in, in private and say, "Listen, I just want to really thank you for allowing me to participate in this crisis management team. Hmm. Information you're giving me." Is information I'm taking home to my family, and and I'm changing the way I do things at home with my children and my and my husband because of that. Um, and she goes, she said, you know, what I see on the news, it's it's, I could I can change the channel, I'm gonna get a get different answer for the same question. She said, but at least I know my trusted source of information. I'm coming back to the company to get that. You know, we brought on a medical advisor and everything else to help make sure that we are giving solid and factual information to our 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 employees as well as making sure that they understand what their choices are. You know, um, there are a lot of things that are personal choices. A lot of times we tell them you need to go talk to your, your personal physician because your medical case and your situation may not be the same as everybody else. So, you know, we need to manage through that. I think the other thing that was really important that came out of this, this crisis management environment because of the pandemic was really changing our focus with respect to how we interact with our people. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say even to an extent, a smaller extent, but even myself, I'm guilty of this. 
you know, the belief that if you're not in the office sitting at your desk, Monday to Friday, <laughs> five, you're not working. And that's not the case. You know, everybody's working remotely right now. And, and in fact, in a lot of spaces, we found that they're even more effective and efficient uh, working and flexible, but working from home. So that was a first learning lesson is that we need to be more understanding and more flexible with our people. Um, but I think that the most important lesson out of all of this was was mental mental wellness is is recognizing we oh, for sure yeah. it's not just about having a, a a weekly team meeting and saying Brian give me an update on all the work you're doing right it's not just about the update on the work you're doing it's about having you don't have to be best friends with everybody but it's about having that human interaction and, and I'll give you a quick example um, one of the things that I did with my team Brian is uh, we have our our we'll call it our business team meeting on Mondays and on Fridays when the weather was nice. Uh, we created a walk and talk where we'd have a, a half hour uh, teams meeting. So an online meeting where I encouraged all my team members to get out of the house, you know, put their headphones in, <laughs> just get outside, get some fresh air. And we're going to walk for a half hour and just talk, talk about, Hey, how are your renovations going at home? How are the kids <laughs> doing? Whatever. What are you doing this weekend? But nothing about work. Let's just interact on a, on a human level. And then of course, when the weather started getting bad, you know, I started to notice my team members more and more were staying inside for the walk and talk. And so I said, all right, let's keep that up. So we changed it to story time with Harold. And every Friday we have story time with Harold where, you know, everybody comes to the table with uh, with uh, two two truths and a lie and uh, <laughs> figure out which one's the lie. And then and then we tell the stories behind the truth. So we learn a little bit more about each other and and it really brings us together. The morale has actually improved because of that. And I think, you know, as leaders, we're responsible for that morale. Um, we need to make sure that our people are are engaged, that they're that they're happy, um, that they uh, you know that they're not overtasked or task saturated. Um, you know we have that responsibility, and frankly, sometimes the only way you're going to know that is by having that interaction with them and being able to start seeing some of the signs and cues. And you're not acting the way you normally act. Is everything okay? Um, because otherwise, you don't have a clue. We have people out there that are sponges, right? They will soak up and soak up everything you throw at them until they reach yeah. the point where they're saturated and then they just overflow and it's too late. So, you know, what it's, 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 it's interesting. You mentioned, mentioned that, I mean, humans, obviously we're social creatures. We, we respond and react to the environment, but even to that effect, you know, you hear a lot, uh, you know, we, we need the right people. We want to hire the right people, but then there's other people that are of the belief that if you get the environment, right, you know, one person could be completely polar opposites depending on the environment. So even to that effect, I mean, do, do you feel perhaps that it is solely incumbent upon the leaders to create an environment that is completely conducive to, you know, good morale and, and growth and, and nurturing and really a place where people want to wake up in the morning, as for example, and come to work? Do you feel that's that's solely upon, you know, upon the leaders to do that? No, I don't think it's solely upon the leaders. I think it's, I think it's honestly, it's a collaborative approach. Uh, I, I think, you know, your team needs to be just as responsible when it comes to, to maintaining that, that really positive work environment. Um, I think it's the leader's responsibility to monitor it and identify issues early on if possible and, and intervene. Um, you know, try and manage it before it becomes an actual problem. Uh, identify those early signs and, and get in front of it. Uh, I think that's extremely important, but but I think the ownership is amongst all of them. Uh, you, if you you can't stand in front of everybody and say be happy, right? Be happy, be you know work well, and that you're getting back into uh, into the, you know, the 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 authoritative manner versus being more of a collaborative approach. So you know I think I think the leader is just that they need to lead, so they need to lead by example. So um, you know again you need to act appropriately within the work environment. And you know, express the values of your organization and and the values and ethics that you believe everybody should in, in your team should be uh, displaying or expressing. You need to lead by example and, and do that first. You know, you you can't you can't stand in front of people and talk to them about using appropriate language in the workplace if you're in the workplace dropping f bombs left, right, and center. Right. So oh no, no so, of course. <laughs> but I think but I think we're all jointly responsible, and I think you know it's also important at at the at the leadership level to be able to communicate with other leaders within the organization because they see other things. You know, I I may sit back and look at my team and I go, we're in happy land, everything is great. Meanwhile, another leader who's getting feedback from their people who interact with my people are saying, you know, your people aren't that happy actually. They're just they act that <laughs> way around you. So it's important to be able to get that feedback and keep your finger on the pulse uh, and identify what if, if there is an issue, what's triggering that? Um, and maybe there's a way to, to adjust or change that. And I can tell you, my management style, uh, my approach to things, not just with COVID, but just overall, I, if I look back 
10 years of my career and look at mm-hmm. where I was to where I am now, I interact with my people much differently than I did, you know, because I've learned. I've learned from some great mentors. I've learned from, unfortunately, from some failures where, you know, I failed yeah. individuals and and I got that, I was able to get that feedback, whether it was during an exit interview or whatever, where it's like, you know, I could have approached that a little bit differently and maybe it would have been received a bit differently. So, you know, I definitely know I've learned over the over time as well. And uh, and I think, you know, when I have discussions with some of my up and coming leaders in my team, I have those same discussions with them. It's it's not about my way or the highway. It's about listening, <laughs> talking, understanding and and conversing with your people. You don't have to be best friends, but you don't also yeah. be enemies. Right. So you can make it work. No. But uh, I think we all own have joint ownership of it. Absolutely. Interesting. So I, I tell you what, Harold, you know, you've been absolutely so overtly generous with your time and I'm so thankful to have have the chance to uh, garner your insights. Certainly beneficial for me and I don't want to see uh, like my channel self-serving, but absolutely I've, I've enjoyed our time here together for sure. And I'm certain any, anyone watching this will, will take a lot away. So maybe as as some parting words, if you will, and, and I'll tell you, you know, for myself and, you know, as soon as I put three chevrons on my shoulders, you know, I, I started to get a lot of the questions that I would always pose, such as, you know, what what certificates and courses and, you know, always looking for the magic pill as, as far as wanting to endeavor to that next, next role. And if only it was that easy, I suppose. But, you know, so, somewhat to that sentiment, I mean, you know, perhaps, in, in, you know, having some parting words here, do you perhaps have any all-encompassing insight or advice for those who are striving to realize these leadership roles, climb the next rung in the ladder, or even just perhaps navigate the the, the realm that they've just entered into? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any specific courses offhand, but I can tell you that um, I, I truly believe in it and I practice it with, with my team members as well and some of my managers that are moving along in the organization. Uh, I encourage them to to take uh, management training that uh, different sessions of training that express different management styles. And it's not mm-hmm. to adopt, adopt a management style to make it your own. It's to understand different ways of managing and interacting with people and leading people. Uh, and then and then take components of that and build your own, right? Build yourself from that. Um, and so, you know, I think there's there's different management teachings out there that I think we can all benefit from. And then I also try to encourage them to, to read some, there's some great books out there from some various leaders that really, I mean, every one of them that I read, I, if I can walk away with a single nugget from each one of those books, <laughs> And I start adding those nuggets together, uh, you, you know, you're setting yourself up for success. So, uh, you know, I definitely think as leaders, it's not just going to come to you. It doesn't magically appear in front of you. You've got to seek that out. And again, that's finding good mentors who who lead by example and then it's doing your own research. So find find some good training, some good management training on, you know, management soft skills and uh, how to interact with your people, how to have difficult conversations you know, who stole my cheese. There's a whole bunch of them out there that you can read and look at them. <laughs> and then there's some great leadership books out there as well. Uh, and uh, some of them are some, some, somewhat humorous. Some of them talk about um, some very difficult events and how leaders managed through it and dealt through it. And, and even reflecting on some of their errors or mistakes of their, you know, that they made during that event. I think those are, those are how we're going to succeed. You're, you're going to actually learn from somebody else's mistake uh, or somebody else's success instead of, you know, doing it yourself and and repeating you know repeating history so uh, that would be my advice is just get out there and research um interact with others and uh and you know find find what makes sense for you and for your your environment and your organization and and make it your own excellent well certainly has some excellent parting words and harold again i thank you so very kindly for your time here and for all of you out there who are watching uh this is calling all leaders conversations with leaders for aspiring a leaders and certainly we had a a very inspiring leader with us here today harold wax again thank you so very kindly for your time thanks brian appreciate it